So here we are, Raysbury One. It's been a long, long time. Uh, I fished here for those of you that don't know, for about three years back in the day when I had air down here. Um, I say fished here, I practically lived here. I absolutely love this lake. So here we are, Raysbury One. It's been um, considerably improved on the banks. Uh, lake's still the same. Um, yeah, absolutely. I lived here, I was here all the time. I used to spend loads of time out on a boat. Uh, and back when I fished here, 20 whatever years ago it was, there was only one spot on the lake that was out of bounds. And this is it. So uh, for this session, I've decided to start here just because I can. Um, this side of the lake, it's actually been split, it used to all be one, the north and the south lake, and they've built a divide, so it's two separate lakes. Um, the other half, the north lake's got a syndicate on it, uh, and this side is sort of by invitation, I think, at the moment. Uh, and this is the governor's swim, so I'm in here to start with. Uh, you get a great big piece of water to fish to. And I'm back at Raysbury, and I'm really looking forward to it. Right. Here we are. I know there's at least three different ranges of bars out there. My memory isn't quite good enough to remember exactly where they are. So I'm going to echo them up nice and quick just to find the top of the bar <coughs> and then probably fish one on it and one behind it. And then Oh, it does start to come up a bit there, a little bit. Oh, so a little bit, quite a lot. Uh, it's coming right up there. So if I flick that over to the camera, huh, we get gravel. We get lots of gravel. Oh, that's proper shallow right on top. that do for one rod. Like it, it's easy, isn't it? Right, I've had a couple more, two or three casts. I'm sort of working my way round um, from where I found that shallow bit. Didn't find an awful lot with the next two. Chuck this right out there, straight out towards that island. I don't really want to end up fishing them all on the same sort of features, although saying that, I don't think I'll find something as uh, obvious as that one. Again, that's just sort of base depth. Bit there, down, up. Oh yeah, that's coming up. I say not as much as the other, but enough. So a little look, see what it's actually like. A little bit scrubby on the back there. Oh, it's, it's not gravel, is it? It's sand. Loves a bit of sand. Yeah, I'm liking that. I'll clip that one up, I think. I'm just gonna have a quick chuck out here to see if there's anything I'm missing out on, but I'm happy with those two spots and that corner of the island comes highly recommended, so I've probably got all I need, but you never know. Grass can sometimes be greener. Seems to be that same range when I hit that range, if there's a, it's starting to come up here and it all seems to be on that same, probably, you know, where they drag lined it and they dug it. That looks very green, doesn't it? Oh, well, that is silkweed, I think. Or something there. Like bricks or something on top of it. Bricks and weed. Is that good? I don't think so. I've actually had um, a little bit of a result, to be honest, as the lights changed when I was, had my echo out there. I noticed that there's actually t the tops of two marker canes out there, a red and a green one. I assume that's Raf's, the, the name of the guy that fishes here, the governor, the owner. 
uh, I assume they're his markers and they seem to be pretty much on top of one of the bars so that will make my life an awful lot easier for that bit um, and I found a nice little drop off on this little close island to the left I'm going to fish one down there Fortunately, I've turned up at sort of the worst time of day for showing fish, sort of middle of the afternoon. It's actually quite warm. Um, but I'm just going to set up base camp in here and see how we get on. Have a good look this evening, through the night and the morning. And if I haven't got it right, I'll be moving. Just going to fish singles to start with. Um, I am going to put bait in. I'm probably going to put quite a bit of bait in because there's quite a few fish in here, growing fish. Um, but I just want to watch the water for a little while uh, and let the fish sort of lead me a bit. No good putting it in. As I say, you can't take it out, but you can always put more in. So I'm going to wait and see. Then I'm going to fill it in. Well, as all good stories, I should start with a beer. Uh, I decided to take myself and Maddie, and you, and you, and you, there's a whole crew behind there, to the Perseverance, the famous pub at Raysbury. Uh, scene of, well, many a disaster, many a happening, Christmas parties, celebrations of big fish. Um, and tonight, well, just a couple of ciders and a steak and chips, I think. Come on, come on, miss. Sorted. Right, let's go carp angling. Right, here we go. First fish of the trip. Raysbury one. Probably not the biggest one in the lake, but definitely a very, very pretty one. And early as well. I just got the rigs out there for the night. And away it trundled over a big bed of bait as well, which is always a good sign. Get a quick bite on a big bed of bait usually means there's plenty more to come. So thank you very much, Mr. Carp. Mwah. Curly kiss. I'll pop you back. Get the rig out there. Get ourselves another one. Happy days. Right, here we go, first one of the morning. Nice, big scaled linear. Bit bigger than his mate yesterday. They really are gorgeous fish, these. Oh, it's Raysbury Dawn and Raysbury Carp. Happy with him. And we. I think you're happy, but I'm happy. Lovely one. Right, well, obviously I've had a couple of fish. Um, sort of feel like I've missed the trick a little bit um, because the bulk of the fish, there's quite a lot of fish in here now, stockfish, the bulk of the fish have been right over the back there, um, off of sort of mouth of Bryant's Bay and Bryant's Point, which is a long way from here. Um, there's been a couple out towards the island um, which are just about in range. I've thumped this one out as far as I can possibly get it, so I've got quite high hopes for that one. Uh, but like I say, Bryant's, pa Bryant's Point seems to be the sort of main focus of where these fish are at the moment. Um, it'd be nice to be sat over there actually. I've got some good memories of Bryant's Point. Uh, done a lot of fishing back in the day on there. 
Um, used to get the fish out of range. We used to use boats on here then and boat out sort of to the bars in the middle. Um, I remember once in February, that's probably my best memory of Brian's Point. Uh, we'd been out on what we called a winter tour. There was uh, me, Phil Thompson, Jacko, four or five of us. Just went around local lakes trying to get a bite in the winter. You know what it's like when it's really, really tricky. Uh, it got to about mid-February and I'd had enough. I just missed this place so much. So I came back down, went on Bryant's Point. It was very, very flooded at the time. All the main swim was underwater and I had to put my wellies on just to get on the end of the point. Uh, there was nowhere to bivvy up on there, so I decided to just throw one rod off the end of the point. Bear in mind this is mid-February, it's got no record of winter fishing on here then. Um, and I set my bivvy up further back and fished two out the side. And uh, it wasn't very many hours later when that single rod roared off and somehow I was attached to a raspberry carp in February. Played it in, went in the net, I looked in there and just thought, oh my God, it was Mary, which at the time was probably, if not the biggest fish in the country, certainly in the top three in the country. Uh, it was just amazing, blew me away. I wasn't expecting anything really, just come up here to beer. Popped her up on the scales. There was a lot of talk at the time um, that it might do a British record if it was ever caught, sort of that high weight time of year. Um, and it wasn't, but the scale spun round and stopped at 49 pounds and 15 ounces. So it was <laughs> one ounce short of 50 pounds. Um, but in the middle of February, I mean, absolute top result. Uh, and this was back before the days of social media and that, so word took longer to get around. But I remember bumping into a bloke shortly afterwards uh, who'd heard the news and he said to me that I was unlucky. Um, I assume he meant because it was one ounce under 50 pounds, but when you've caught a 49 pound, 15 ounce carp from Raysbury in February, unlucky was the very last thing I was feeling, I can assure you of that. I was absolutely over the moon with it. Um, so yeah, that was my Bryant's Point main capture, but I did have Mary's mate and I had Malins from there. It was a very, very good area, um, but I think that February memory is the overriding one. And like I say, if I was sat over there now, I think I'd be getting bites because I've been watching fish poking their heads out close in. But hopefully a few will drift over this way and we'll get a bite. It's looking bang on for it. Well, I've managed to turn him before the island. I've stuck the waders on. <coughs> In case I need to get him through. All going a bit better now. Right, we've managed to get him inside the island again. Now he's going up the channel. They certainly like to scrap. We got colour. Oh, that's hard work, this carp fishing, look. Oh, he's a nice one. Lovely job. Well, how about this? Thought bite time had gone. And uh, we've got a brace of raspberry carp. Even ours managed to bag one. <laughs> Even me. <laughs> what do you reckon then? Like it? Love it. It's an absolute privilege to be here at Raysbury and a dream come true to catch a, a raspberry carp. Yeah, they're beautiful as well, aren't they? That's this stunning. This new breed. So dark, I mean, black, yours is black on top, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. Fantastic fish. We're loving it. Carp angling at its <laughs> finest, or as close as we can get anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been lovely. Yeah, superb. Hopefully more to come, but I'm well happy with this, and I bet you're well happy. Turn him around a bit, so a little bit. He's, oh, he's proper black, isn't he? He is. Can swap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy with this one. <laughs> we are happy. Fantastic. And all this before breakfast, which is coming next. Excellent. <laughs> oh, well done. Here we go. <laughs> nice brace going back to their great big home. Back to Rosebury. Bit like me. Lovely job. Oh, he's going. Woo, there, fella. Well done. Oh, <laughs> right, that's the fish returned, and now the most important part of the day breakfast. The 
breakfast of champions. Ideally, seeing as I've caught, I should have mushrooms. It's an old savvy tradition. You catch a carp, you eat mushrooms for breakfast. Um, but I haven't. But I have got, there, sausages, bacon, eggs, which is plenty enough. Sausages from the butchers just up the road, which are absolutely delicious. So, there we go. Job done. Sit and watch the pond. Wait for me breakfast. Happy. Well, it's the middle of the day. It's actually really quite warm. I think it's, I don't know, must be in the 20s. Um, obviously it's not ideal for fishing, so we're going to go for a little walk around Raysbury, visit a few old haunts, um, see what they're like nowadays. First one's this way. Right, well, if you've ever seen a picture of Raysbury 1, you've seen that. This has got to be the most iconic of all sites at Raysbury. That is the dredger. Um, it hasn't moved, obviously, in a lot of years, decades. Um, I'm surprised nobody's been out there and cut it up for scrap, to be honest but that is part and parcel of Rosebury One, Dredger Bay. You've got um, one, two, three, four entrances uh, in and out. You can go up to the Finger Bays up here, out into the section I'm fishing, across to the Douglas Lane, um, and out to the Douglas Lane Point and the snags. The fish used to live in these snags on the far side over there. They absolutely loved them. Um, had a few battles in here myself. Had Mary's mate from this swim. Um, out towards the back of that central island. Um, she was actually on all night. She managed to get herself weeded and I couldn't do a thing with it, so I wait, waited until daylight. Went out in the boat, handlined her out, uh, and then played her out from the boat. Yeah, it's been a scene of a few fishy happenings. It's also been the scene, the scene of a few non-fishy happenings. I mean, I don't know if you've read my first book, but in there, um, I don't think, politically correct now, I can't call it what I did call it, so we call it the Battle of the Travelling People. Um, I was sat up just in a swim just here next door one night and a young lad come running into me swim and said, can you hide me mister, they're after me. And I said, mate, nothing to do with me. Uh, he ended up hiding in the bushes and then a load of slightly larger blokes came in um, looking for him. Uh, and then a policeman came in with an Alsatian and then a helicopter came in and literally hovered here right above my head. Uh, my, my old dog Fat Sam with me, um, she was going mad at this helicopter and I was going mad at the police dog as well. Um, and that went on for most of the night and eventually it all sort of calmed down, everyone disappeared. And right when I thought it was all over, I was just about to go to bed, this little traveller lad came back out the bushes, he's been hiding in there all along. So uh, again, that is just part of being at Raysbury. You get a, a lot of happenings, some with the fish, some with the locals, but it's a lovely place, it really is. And there we go, Dredger Bay. This way to the Finger Bays, follow me. Right, this is the North Lake. Uh, we're standing on a decking area, which used to be uh, a concrete pillbox, old fashioned war pillbox. Uh, looking out over the North Lake, which is now, when I fished here, the North and the South were all one. There was a, a channel through here to the right, but that's now a divide. Uh, which has separated the lakes. Um, swim over there is the Rocky Barge, very well known swim, Springgates Point. Uh, I had a lot of good captures from here. My first ever Raysbury carp from two thirds of the way out to this island. Um, fish uh, known as Malins. I've caught a few out of here. Right down the bottom is Sunny Meads Corner, which is the shallows where they used to go in the spring. Um, had Mary down there and a couple of the other Oddens. Yeah, it's nice, the North Lake. There also used to be, that, that, that swim over there was called the Off Licence. There was an Off Licence behind there and a shop and we used to stop off there on the walks round and get a Tangle Twisters, I think they're called, those lemon and lime ice creams and a couple of cold beers. And those Kinder Eggs, do you remember Kinder Eggs? They were, they, I think they still do them, little chocolate eggs and inside when you break it open, there's a blue or yellow plastic egg 
and inside that's a toy. Or well, we used to get them, we used to chuck the chocolate away or give it to Fat Sam the dog because it was disgusting. We used to play with the toys a little bit, we used to collect them. But the egg was what we wanted it for, the plastic egg. If you got a wine bottle cork and put it inside the egg, wound it with line, three ounce lead on the end, it made the perfect boat markers. When you got out in the lake and you found a spot, you used to open the egg just a little bit, let the cork spin until the lead at the bottom, clip the egg back together and leave it on the surface to mark your spot. And at one stage, this lake used to be covered in little yellow and blue eggs from everybody's different markers. Little tip for you. But no, haven't stood here for a while. It's gin clear at the moment, this water. It's, I've, I've never seen it so clear. Incredible. See all the bars and everything. Can't see any carp, mine. There's a lot of good carp in this half now. A lot of the bigger carp are in this side. Oh, here's one. Just coming here across the bar. Looks like a mirror. Looks like a linear. I don't know if anyone's got a polarising lens on that, have they? See him coming in beautiful. Just come and say hello. Tell me how much he's missed me. Right, this is the finger bays. Um, sort of joins the top of the South Lake. Used to join it round to the North Lake and also joins it to the Dredger Bay. Um, this is the main finger bay, the larger of them. Dog's dragging me around. Um, that area over there is like just a little tiny peninsula that we actually call Poets or Poets Corner because uh, I came walking through the bushes there one day and found some little hippie guy sitting there quite happily reading a book of poetry. So that became Poets. Um, not caught an awful lot in the past out of here. My mate Phil Thompson did. For some reason he did three nights in here in November um, and it had no real winter form of the lake anyway, let alone a little bay like this. He blanked the first night, blanked the second night. I'm not sure why he did the third night, but he caught two of the proper old originals on that third night. I think it was Mary's mate, might have been the Hoover, but two of the big fish anyway, two of the targets, the A-team. Um, but it always part of the walk round this was, always a beautiful place. To, to be honest, now, it's probably even nicer than it was then. It's grown up a lot. You know, it was always overgrown, but now it's, well, it's beautiful now, as you can see. Um, but always part of the walk round. Down the bottom of that bay, um, which only just, just goes round the corner, um, there's a bush we used to call, call a tench bush. Uh, and quite often, there was always tench in there, but quite often you'd see just one or maybe two of the smaller old fish. Measles used to like it in there. He was a famous old carp, sort of a mid-20. Um, he used to sit under that bush a lot. Um, fish we used to call the Oddens. There was Mary's gang or the A-team, if you like, of the bigger fish, but there was also some mid-twenties in here that were ancient and were very, very, very hard to catch. Um, and you'd find those sort of fish in ones and twos just sort of pugged up in little snaggy areas and that was one of their favourites. But I always liked this finger base. We had some great barbecues and that on the bank here. We used to clear swims out and drag all the wood up here, chop it up, have big bonfires. Proper bit of fishing. Love it. Could do that now if you like. Shall we? Yeah. <laughs> right, this is right up the top end. You've got Sunny Meads Corner just down there. There's somebody actually fishing in there, so we won't go in and disturb them. Um, <clears throat> like I said earlier, that's the place where they used to get in the spring, and there's a, a spindly tree that hangs over the water there, and we used to shin up there. And the first year I fished it, it was still a closed season and the fish used to get in there all the time. We used to practically hand feed them. Um, but during that season, or during that winter, they abolished the closed season. So I was able to fish it the next spring, which was obviously like clubbing seals for about two days until they realised they were being fished for. Only thing wrong with this bank is you've got the uh, commuter line. It's the Windsor to uh, Richmond, I think, train line runs along there. Um, so in the mornings and in the evenings, you get trains full of commuters going past. You get the odd one in the day, but I did get caught short quite literally one morning. I was just along there, but it was just like this. Railway line there, bushes there. Got a call of nature early in the morning and I thought, oh, I'll just sneak in there and do my business. There I was, crouched down, won't go into graphic details, but I was just approaching the toilet paper stage. 
and a train came through and the lights were red and it stopped right there, literally right behind me. And I'm crouched down in the bushes and I just looked down at my knees and waited. And I could just feel all these eyes burning into the back of my head as I'm there with my trousers and pants around my ankles, probably two rod lengths away from about 50 commuters on their way to work. Yeah, they didn't have a good day. Anyway, onwards. Well, I haven't stood up here for literally decades. This is the tench bush or the tench tree. But unfortunately, measles and his mates aren't here anymore. They used to sit right down here, right underneath the branches, totally safe from everybody. But this was the top viewing spot if you wanted to see a raised with Odden. Surprised there's not some of the new fish in here actually. It's gorgeous. So, so tucked away up here. I came through here in a boat one day, uh, just up there in the poets. <clears throat> and I was, I was in a boat, me and Fat Sam, my dog, dead quiet, just paddling through. And I heard this scream and I looked round and right on the bank, right next to me, at my eye level, was a stoat that was taking a rabbit, completely unaware of me. And I saw it take the rabbit and it sort of froze, held it until it stopped kicking and then dragged it off in the bushes. And I just carried on on my way, it was great. Up close nature. God, I love this lake. Right, this is party point, as we called it, um, because it's a big flat area and we could have a party here. Uh, I'd like to tell you amazing stories of the fish we caught from here, but I don't think any of us ever caught anything from this swim, but we had some good days here and good nights. Uh, it was just a perfect sort of meeting point, you know, when you're dotted about, like I said, we used boats as well, so we could have been anywhere. Um, and on a nice hot day like today, we'd gather somewhere like this, a couple of bottles of uh, cold beer, and, uh, well, maybe more than a couple, and just while away a few sunny hours. Right, we're now in, well, I'd say we're in a swim called the Doctors. We're not actually, because it's sort of the proper doctor's swim surgery, we used to call it, has grown over it, it was just along here. Um, but as near as damn it, anyway, we're right up the top end of the South Lake. Um, that's the Douglas Lane and Douglas Lane Point that we looked at from further along at the party point and if you look right down the lake as far as you can um, there's an island on the right hand side right at the bottom and that's the island I'm looking at from my swim and that over there is a white stick in what looks like a swim that's the end of Bryant's Point, Bryant's Bay is round the corner so we've sort of gone right round this section two sides of the South Lake and a look tiny bit of the North Lake. It gives you a, a sort of idea of the scale of the place and you imagine when the, both these lakes were joined as one and you're hunting about 20, 25 carp. It's, uh, it was a bit of a mission. But they used to get caught, you know, they were catchable fish. Well, some of them were catchable fish, some of them never got caught the whole time I was here and never got caught thereafter. Probably long gone by now. But um, yeah, rather than go round and out the village and back round the other side, we're going to double back on ourselves and go the opposite way around the North Lake, the way we haven't yet been. And uh, unfortunately, the shop and the off licence aren't there anymore, so we'll have to just walk on by. But eventually, we'll end up back where we started. And the dog will be walked, eh? And we'll have seen a few fish. And had a few memories, eh? It does seem strange being back, but it's bloody lovely. What a day for it, oh, it's gorgeous. Well, you want to go, don't you? Come on then. Right, when I started fishing this swim, um, obviously I've not fished this swim before. Um, I was given advice that the corner of this island was a very good spot. Um, it sort of hasn't been so for me, to be honest. Um, it's the only rod I haven't had a bite on. I put a fair bit of bait, I suppose, down there. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a check and see if it's still there or um, if it's all been eaten and I've just been done. So I'm going to chuck Echo Pro out there and have a proper look. As in a proper camera look. And that should be just on that slope there. Here we go. 
decoy. That has been proper fed on in the past, that spot. They've got that down to bedrock almost. It's definitely an area that they like. Can't see as much bait as I thought it would, to be honest. You can see it here, just getting dark. That's it, drop it dropping off the edge, the near side edge of the feature. Yeah, that's just coming off the bar now. Hmm. Might put a little bit more bait on it tonight and check it in the morning. I think I'm going to have a little search about and see if I can find something else. Maybe something out there to the right. Right, I've made my decision. Um, I did pick up a fair bit of bait, to be honest. Now I've looked back at that footage uh, off the corner of that island. So I've moved it a little bit further out. I've had a little drag through with the Echo Pro out there. Found there was a couple of fish showed a bit further off the island this morning and a little bit further out. Uh, it seems to come up a little bit of a hump there. Um, so that's that rod for tonight. They're back on the spots where I caught fish before. I've got three rods, I'm happy with them all. We're gonna catch some carp, but first, we're gonna light the barbie, because this crew look pretty hungry to me. So, barbecue, carp, just like carp angling. Here's carp angling, isn't it Maddie? Feed her, she needs feeding. Let's get it on. Right, here we go. Night time bite. Nice sort of pre-quarter fully scaled. 20 plus raised with carp. Oh, I just got to sleep as well. It roared off. Didn't you mate? You didn't want me to go to sleep, did you? Wanted Laney up, and up I am. Excellent. Oh. Yeah, he's a beautiful fish. I like him a lot. Mm -hmm. Here we go, nice little plump, dark, linear. I've had an absolutely mental night. Um, I've had 30 minutes sleep between half 11 and midnight. And apart from that, it's just been bites, baiting, rig tying, lots of carp angling and tench. Dropped a couple, landed a few, I say, had a tench, kept the bait going in. This area I'm in does seem to be a, a proper night spot in the morning. As soon as it gets light, you see them working their way further out into the lake. A long way further out into the lake. But there's also been a lot of fish showing further up in No Carp Bay, so. I'm not sure yet, but I'm considering taking a couple of rods up there in a minute. Let's see if we can grab a daylight bite. Here's a little one. Pretty one, but small one. I did have a few small ones in the night. It's been a shoal of the lesser fellas came through. He is a dear little thing. Still proper pretty fish though, aren't they? Gorgeous scaling on them. A 
another take. <coughs> it has been absolutely crazy. Like these big shoals of fish in this lake, when they come through you, you know all about it. Of course, this one's proper going. Here he comes. Perfect. Another one bites the dust. Grab the mat. Here's another pretty one. They're all pretty ones. I'm going to stop saying they're pretty ones because you can see they're pretty ones. Everyone's a perler. And yeah, lovely. Got a couple of huge great scales on this side. Look at that. Absolute belter. You're a corker, mate. That's what you are. Right, just like it did yesterday morning, um, gone incredibly dead here. They seem to move in here at night, feed, and then uh, shift out again in the morning. But I've seen a few of them going that way, Hupsall Mary's Point, No Carp Bay. Um, so I'll just take a couple of rods, a net, a mat, and a cameraman, and um, shoot up there and see if we can grab one. Right, well, we came around it for a quick bite, and it certainly was a quick bite. I didn't even turn the alarm on. Um, just casting over towards that peninsula there. He's wanting to kite round to these bushes and I'm not wanting him to. So, sometimes you can pull, it, pull them towards what you don't want them to go to, they go the other way, but it's a bit of a risky operation, especially when you get caught in the brambles. Will he fall for it? No. Oh, he's determined for that big bush. I want to see where he is, but I daren't lift the tip in case he's just under the bush. I can see a bit of a, a surge there. I think he's close. Oh, he's come out. Here we go. Oh, we've got some snags and stuff going on. Half a tree with him as well. Oh, nice. Quite a nice one, to be honest. <laughs> Call him the jungle carp, because he's bringing the jungle in with him. Oh, we've got him out of the snag. Oh, he's a common. So that's one. Not as big as I thought now, the trees come off. And here we go. One quick bite. Oh, excellent. Lovely one. Beautiful fish. No carp, bay carp. You're not supposed to be in here. You read the sign, you wouldn't come in. I love it when a plan comes together. Nip up here, get a quick bite. Back in time for breakfast. Top bombing. Away she goes. Safe and sound. Right, I've decided. I've just gone back, grabbed my air bomb, bucket of bait. There's loads of fish out here still. Um, although it is getting a bit warm, I'm gonna put just two or three uh, air bombs of bait out there. It's a lot quieter than most other sort of systems. And then chuck hook bait over the top. See if we can get a couple more. Getting greedy now. Only wanted a quick bite, now I want a quick two. Or three. That'll do. Equivalent of about three or four pouchfuls of bait. It'll pop up over the top, a wafter. Be good to go. Right, while the rods are just there doing their thing or waiting to do their thing, I'm going to have a little nap about in this little bay with the sonar. 
see what's out there. Nineteen foot, very, very flat. Nineteen and a half foot. Well, you wouldn't think that looking out there. Not really an area of the lake of. I fished even back in the day, to be honest. I think because this swim was very public access back then. There's usually lots of people in here. 18 feet. Deep, I think. Oh, just starting to creep up a bit there. 17 and a half. 17, oh yeah, you can see it just, just coming up on the sky. Oh, oh, it's coming up there, lovely. 15, 14, 13, you see a little lump there on the top. Yeah, it's sort of 13, 13 and a half there, which is, you know, six foot difference there. A couple of rodlins behind it. And starts to just drop away a little bit there as well, this side. Nice features, those deep bars when they're like that. Yeah, don't always want to be up four or five foot. Yeah, and then it's coming back up to the marginal shelf. So sort of deep beyond comes in, a little bit of a bar, drops down in the gully and then shoots up the shelf. Nice. We're in. In case you hadn't noticed by the noise. <laughs> that is what you call a screamer. Just touch them on the snags down there. Man, he's doing it himself. Bugger. Might be time for some breakfast, I think. Oh well, can't win them all. Delivery for Mr. Uh, Lane? Ha, ah, young Rick. How you doing, mate? You all right? Not bad, mate. How you doing? All Thank right. Thank you very much. Cheers. Catching. Some of Jonathan's finest, is it? PB it specials? Is, mate, yeah. Yeah, I've had a few. You're sure fishing you're out. Out. I'm going to be fishing down the road, yeah, shortly. Oh, yeah? I've got to pop these in on the way. Horton? Yeah. Yeah. Nice one. I'm actually doing it. I've got... Uh, this is for something. I'm doing some rigs and that today. Yeah? Yeah, I don't know a lot, but you know a lot about rigs, don't you? I know a little bit about rigs. You know more than me about rigs. I've only got one. Yeah. Give you a tutorial <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Fancy <laughs> hanging around for a couple of hours? Give us a hand. Why not? Yeah? Time up for the lads? Yeah, why not? <sighs> Give me a break. I can drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Hello, Thank sweetheart. you very much, sir. Top man. Talk me the tea. I'll put the kettle on. Good man. One sugar. Okay, so uh, Jonathan at PB Products has um, asked me to bring some stuff down to uh, Mr. Lane himself, which I have done. Um, he's also asked me to showcase just a couple of rigs uh, that I like to use for my fishing. Uh, what better place to do it as well than the iconic Dredger Bay at Raysbury. Um, can't really beat that for a scene. Um, let's talk about rigs. I guess the main thing I concentrate when I'm doing rigs um, is the, I call it the three shuns. Separation, rotation and indication. Um, indication is more about the lead setup um, and, and, and how you're having it on your lead core and stuff. Uh, rotation for me, obviously I'll cover that in a minute once I've tied a rig and I'll show you what I mean. Um, and hook bait separation as well. Um, unless I'm fishing a choddy or a pop-up, if I'm fishing a waft or a bottom bait on a bottom bait kind of setup, I, I, quite, I want a decent bit of separation between the hook bait and the hook so the hook can find its way into a lip somewhere. Let's have a look. Okie dokie, so I'm going to start with um, with a rig that you can pretty much take anywhere, uh, it gets frowned upon now and then, but it's the Chod rig. Um, and for this, I'm going to be using the Silk Ray Leader. 
um, for the demonstration of this one, I'm going to use the weed one, which is a nice green and black colour. Um, really, really limp. I mean, you can just see now, even when it's dry, it's just following the contours of everything in front of me. Um, but obviously splicing. Now, splicing is something that people tend to shy away from. Um, at PB, we've got these. I'll take it back apart again for the camera. It's basically almost like a paperclip method with a spike on the end. Uh, and what you need to do is you, when, when you've got your leg core, it's really easy to pull the leg core. When you pull the leg core, it makes it narrower and tight and hard to get the needle in. So I tend to come six to eight inches down the leader and push it, push it together almost like a snake skin so it bulks up a little bit. It allows me access with my needle. Once you started it on the needle like so, you just gently ease it down all the way, you go past that link. I tend to put, I tend to cover the whole needle and a bit more if I can. What you're doing here is you're actually governing the length of your splice and therefore the strength of it. The overlap of your splice I personally think should be at least an inch to an inch and a half. Poke the needle back through the end, like so, and then you've got the teardrop shape there. I always wet everything down, a little lick of that. Push that back through, like so. And then you pull that back through itself. So it comes out the other side. I get my pulling tool. I hook that in there. Pull that back down. Just go over it with your thumbs, just make sure it's all smooth and there's no tag end poking out there. If there's a tag end poking out there and this ends up being the top of the rig, it might not be that safe as your rig needs to, if, if you crack off and you need to lose the rig or the fish needs to lose the rig, it can pass over that splice really, really easily. What I then do from there, I cut off a decent length. About three feet I normally go for, about there. Cut that off. And then the same process again at the other end. Um, splice another loop in there. And you can see like that it's never coming apart. You can see from the lines on my fingers how hard I pulled that. So there we have a bare leader. Now generally speaking, I haven't got a lead here with me, but you can put a lead on the end. Depends if you want to fish your lead to drop off or not, if you want to fix it, if it's not very weedy, you can put your lead on the end, put it right the way through on a swivel like so. For the actual rig, a lot of people fish a choddy with a lead at one end and a bead up here so that the choddy can slide up and down the leader. I'm personally not too keen on that. I like to semi-fix my choddy in one position so that if a fish does pick it up one way or the other, I'm going to get some kind of indication. Now let me just put this on here and I'll show you what I mean. Oh, they come on a threaded applicator, these PB products, chod beads and chod sleeve. So push that through there, get it, get it past the splice bit so it's a bit thinner. Pull that down. All the way through. There we go. So now that's our little boom section. Now it does help to leave one bead off. Take one of the beads off. There's a little lip there. You push that bead. So it just rides over the lip like that. That gives it enough tension not to come off from the cast, but also a little enough tension to come off should a fish need to break free. Blue Peter style is one I made earlier. Um, PB Products chod hook size six. Uh, it's a little PB Products mini ring swivel on there. Can you see that in the shot? What that helps it to do on pickup is rotation. No matter what angle that gets picked up from, the hook instantly flips around towards the bottom lip every single time. I thread that onto my leader, followed by the second bead. And I can show you what I mean about the double beads now. So that goes on and again exactly the same thing push that just so it covers that lip 
Now that is on there well enough. Now, with the lid on this end, that's going to go down, it's going to hit the bottom, and it's going to settle nicely like that. Now when you get a pickup, I will put a pop up on here. With a fish, if a fish goes that way, I'm going to get some indication. If a fish goes that way, it's going to feel the resistance of the lead. So either way, there's going to be resistance on the hook. Um, whereas when you haven't got that bead, like a lot of chod setups, and that bead is is non-existent. Let's get these bits out of the way. That can move freely up and down the line, which means a fish can effectively pick it up, shake it off, drop it back down and swim off, and you've been done. Um, I just think by semi-fixing it, or pinching it, with that second bead, not only is that going to give me the rotation I'm looking for on the actual rig itself, it's going to give me the indication that I'm looking for at my end. When I'm laying in my bivy or doing whatever it is I'm doing, I'm going to know if something's picked me up. Equally, when I reel in, I'm going to know if I've been done, because one of them beats is going to have been moved. Um, and that's pretty much it, that's how I fish my, uh, that's how I fish my choddy. I'm going to mount a bait on, and a little tip for you, obviously it's really, really easy to just put a round, bright coloured pop-up on uh, whatever your choice. What I do like to do is I use a small 12mm pop-up if I can. I always carry a nice little sharp decorator's knife in my bag. I take a little slice off of that one, and I take the same size slice off of another bait does make the bait quite buoyant, but, but these are made of tungsten, so actually it ends up balancing really, really well. Get both those flat edges, sorry, get both those flat edges sitting next to each other. Go all the way through the needle, like so. I get my bait floss, um, the PB products floss is actually Although floss is floss, it's really waxy, so when you melt it down, you get a nice size blob. I'll just snip that off. I always snip off about sort of 12 to 15 mil. Gives me enough for a decent sized blob. black dot. It's effectively now my hair stop. I pull that back into the bait a little bit and as you can see there the swivel is sunk right up to the barrel there. I can spin that bait again and again and what I like about the double bait again is it offers me the separation that I wouldn't normally get with a single pop-up hard up against that ring. So there we have it. The chod rig. Again, any side, no matter what way it gets hooked at from, that hook is always spinning in the direction that I need it to be doing. Okay, so going back to what I said earlier on about separation and rotation, this is pretty much how I fish my bottom bait rig. Um, it's a coated braid, it's broken there, about an inch, inch and a half of supple braid between there and the eye of my hook. Straightforward knotless knot. Um, nothing complicated. But what I do do that is different is that is mounted again on a micro ring swivel. Um, there's quite a big bit of separation between the hook bait and the hook. So when it picks up, I like a bit of distance between both so that this can catch into the bottom lip easier. If you fish it too tight, when the fish spits it back out, the hook and the hook bait become one package and they get spat out together. With this, when the hook bait's getting spat out, the hook it's getting left behind. Um, and again, the other perception is that a fish is going to come in all the time from this direction. And actually, if a fish comes in from this direction, which could be 50% of the time, if you pick the rig up from that way, with the swivel on it, the hook will always turn where you need it to be. Obviously, it acts a little bit differently underwater. We're on a log at the moment and it's a dry day. Um, but that is pretty much as simple as it gets. Like I say, the only difference is I've mounted my bait on a micro swivel instead of a normal hair. Right, all the rods are out of the lake at the moment. Um, it's that warm part of the afternoon when nothing happens. So I'm going to tie up some fresh rigs. How posh is that? 
Uh, it gives me a chance to show you my little wafter rig, which I love. Right then, the most important item for rig tying is a pair of glasses. Well, it is for me. Actually saying that, even people that don't need glasses, if you go to um, Poundland and get these, they're two times magnification. They don't do anything wrong to your eyesight. They make everything twice as big. Whoa. So now I've got loads of 10 ounce LEDs. So we start off, jelly wire, 25 pound weed. That is my hook link of choice. Break yourself off a bit. Um, give it that bit. So I've caught that in the zip. Break yourself off a bit. Yay long, about length of your tackle box, or you know, you're going to trim it down afterwards anyway. Right, for the first measurement, I hold it to my middle finger and to the centre of my palm. That gives me about the right section just to strip off. Yeah, you shouldn't really use your teeth. You should use a stripping tool. But my teeth are already absolutely ruined from doing this, so I use my teeth anyway. Next, a hook of choice, but I like the Curve KD in a size eight. In fact, I use it all the time. Absolutely love it, they're proper sharp as you'll probably see because the packet keeps sticking to my other fingers. One of them. Now you can tie the loop first, which is probably easiest, so I'll show you that first. Get your soft section on the end. It's all very basic and you've probably all done this a thousand times before. But it don't have to be complicated to be good. Baiting needle, lip hook, through the loop, twist it round, make sure the gate shuts before it comes through, grab your little tag end and pop him through your loop. Even with my glasses I missed that by a country mile didn't I? There you go. Trim off, equal bit on the end. So basically you've just got a loop on the end for your hair. Straightforward, not this knot. This is gonna be the simplest and the quickest rig you've ever seen. No whistles, no bells. Obviously the length of the hair depends on the size of your bait. I like to always end with my bait um, just clear. I, don't, I can't stand baits on the back of the bend. I think it hinders it. I think when it, they blow it out, the hook goes out backwards. I like a bit of separation, so I like the bait to come to about there. So that's the length of me bait there, down to the bottom of the bend. And then, one, two, three, four. Don't need any more than that with braid. Back through from the back to the front. And that is your basic bare bones of the rig but it needs one more very vital component. These, again, from PB, because they're the only people I know that make them. All of these are tungsten. They do a brilliant range of tungsten products. But these little liner liners are absolutely spot on for balancing a 15 mil mainline wafter. Push that through. Got a pre-drilled hole. So simple, simple. Pull that through and pop him over. Make sure, obviously, that it's lined up nice and straight so that your line's coming out the front, opposite the point. Push that down a little bit. And you'll see the angle that that forms there. So that's always going to spin round, whatever you do. Bang. So that's your basic rig. Then you need a salty squid 15 mil wafter. Doesn't have to be salty squid, but if you want to catch lots and lots and lots of fish, I highly recommend it. That was my dog woofing at something, probably nothing in the background. And he 
you just pop your bait on there. Dunk. And pop a little hair stop through the end. And that is it, job done. It is as simple as that. Now with the length of the hair, you know, I ain't saying you've got to do it like I do it. I like quite a long hair. Actually, I actually push that little tube on a little bit more than that. I like a fairly long hair. That's perfect for me. But it doesn't matter if you want to tie that shorter and have it up there, then happy days. Whatever floats your boat. But that floats my boat. Just tie that to my swivel on my lead release clip. Job done. Well, here it is. My AAC mug. The final cup of tea of the session. I'll just sit down, have a little reflection, a cup of tea, and sort of play it all back through my head. It's been lovely. Um, it's been great coming back to Rosebury, to be honest. It's been really, really enjoyable. Caught a load of fish, caught some beautiful fish. Obviously, they're different fish to the ones I used to fish for, but they're young and growing in the future. Um, weather's been very, very kind. Um, no, I think I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. I've not had an awful lot of sleep, though. I'm a little bit on the tired side. But uh, no, I hope you've all enjoyed watching our little film as much as we've enjoyed making it. Obviously, I'd like to say thank you to everybody at RK Leisure for putting up with us once again. And uh, cheers. We'll see you next time.